Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very special show coming right up. Now, recently, I had a conversation with someone that I feel is a great inspiration to so many people. Dr. Herman Williams recently wrote an article on LinkedIn titled, What Do I Say? How Do I Say It? Which discusses his thoughts on his life and how he was saved by a man in an airport when he had his second heart attack, his thoughts on the murder of George Floyd and the racial inequalities in the United States, and how people are reaching out to him, not really knowing what to say or do, but are looking to him as a leader to help guide them in starting the discussions forward. We've had Dr. Williams on the show before. He's a managing director of BDO Nashville Healthcare Advisory Practice, and is a leader in the BDO Institute for Healthcare Excellence and Innovation. He has extensive experience as a senior hospital executive with healthcare expertise that includes the management and operations of large and small scale national clinics and hospitals. Dr. Williams' successful leadership has resulted in achieving the highest and safest levels of quality inpatient and outpatient care. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Herman Williams. Thank you, Marianne. I appreciate it. It's my honor to be on your show today. You know, I am so glad that we're having this discussion. I mean, we've been talking, you're someone I admire, and we've been talking for a while, and I know you wrote this article on LinkedIn. And I have to ask you, like, what inspired you to write the article that you wrote? That's a very good question. Um, I was just, like many people, I just had this burning desire to do something because I felt like I knew what was going on. Um, and I felt like I just wanted to say something. I, I thought about doing a, um, um, uh, Facebook live. I thought about doing an Instagram. I thought about doing a WebEx. I I just, I had to do something. And then I said, you know, I'm just going to write an article because I think that I have a unique experience um, that we can refer to as a unique human experience with another human being of a different ethnicity than me. And I just wanted to share that with people. And I wanted to give people a place where they could start uh, with all the turmoil that's going on today. And so that was the motivator. Well, your article is written, What the title is, What Do I Say? How Do I Say It? And I think that's so important right now because a lot of us are a little confused on what's the appropriate thing to say at this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I would just start out by saying that <laughs> the fact that you're willing to speak is the first step. And all I say is if you speak with with your heart and speak with compassion and openness to learn what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, or if you, or if you understand that there are differences of opinions and to be open to understand what's going on, then nothing is wrong. Um, You know, you just have to speak with your heart. There are a lot of people that are saying things that really don't know what's going on, or they're saying things with not a sense of openness. Um, And maybe we can talk about that today, but I mean, I've learned a lot myself. I consider myself incredibly knowledgeable. Um, You know, I've had quite a bit of schooling. Um, I've got two graduate degrees um, and one doctorate. And and, um, still, I've learned so much this week because of my willingness to be open and to learn and to listen to other people's thoughts and comments. I have, I agree with you. I mean, I've learned a tremendous amount as well. And, you know, I think that's part of the reason why so many people may stay silent because they're trying to figure out, okay, I'm learning all this information. So, you know, the fact that we're starting a dialogue, where do we go from there? Right. And, and, you know, um, what's really fascinating for me is, um, being a man and, you know, having all the sort of 
stereotypical myths about males uh, not being affectionate with each other and not being expressive with each other, I find that I'm surrounded by a bunch of men who both, um, you know, all ethnicities, white, black, Hispanic, whatever. I've gotten several calls and I, and I put one of them in the article. I got a call from a guy who just happens to be a good friend of mine, but he was also a former boss. And I think that's important. You know, we had, so we had a relationship, um, um, you know, a hierarchical relationship. So I have respect for him as a boss, but later we became friends and I hadn't heard from him and he called me and I'm thinking, okay, maybe he's looking for a job. Maybe he's, you know, calling cause he needs some information or I, I, you know, whatever it is, I'm sure it's, it's genuine and I'm happy to help. But he just says to me, man, I called you for one reason to tell you, I love you. <laughs> and I mean, I could feel, I could feel that warmth rush over my body and I could feel, you know, I'm very um, uh, labile and very emotional because of the things that have happened to me. And I could feel sort of the tears well up in my eyes because of how beautiful that was that through all the turmoil, he just started out, look, I want to qualify. (laughs) I don't care what comes after this, but I want to start off with telling you, I love you. (laughs) Uh, And it was beautiful because I said, man, I love you too. And I, I'm so glad you called because I've been calling people. I've been calling my white friends, calling my black friends, calling all kinds of friends to say, look, I appreciate you so much in how important you were to me and, and, you know, fill in, fill in the blank, you know, and for him, it was like, man, I appreciated you as a boss and your compassion. Um, I got another call from another individual guy, a white guy who I said, man, you were my savior while we were at work because I knew I had somebody I could go down to his office and close the door. This was right when uh, Trump had just been elected. And I, I just said, I need somebody to bounce something off to find out, am I like, am I seeing this wrong? And we, we just developed this bond. Uh, and what I find, Marianne, is people don't understand how special they are in someone else's mind. And that's why I, I said, I'm going to write this article to tell people, just reach out to someone you know and say, I love you. I appreciate you, man. Thank you for being there for me. And it's really kind of started a ripple effect. Um, and what the most beautiful thing for me is to see comments from all sorts of people going back to, uh, gosh, I guess as far back as... 2000, even some people actually (laughs) from my high school, one person said, Herman, you were always, you know, a compassionate person and you were always a leader in my mind, you know, things like that, that you, we don't know that how people felt about us, you know? And so I think it's a start to generate this sense of, we do care about each other and let's just level the playing field. Now let's talk about the difficult issues. And so that was really the the genesis of the article. Do you feel that people are really starving for this type of connection right now? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, and as we talk, I'm just going to share for you and your listeners conversations that I've had. I mean, I had a guy call me today. He says, look, I, I just wanted to talk to somebody. I, I don't know. I didn't know where to start. I don't, I, you know, and everybody's feeling that same thing. I want to say something. And, oh, the other thing he said to me is, you know, Herman, I really believe that people are basically good. And I thought about that. I said, you know, that is not something that I think everybody shares, but that is my point of reference is I really feel that people are basically good. Um, And, you know, I have a job that requires me to travel extensively. And I've traveled everywhere, and a lot of that travel has been in small-town America. It's been in Idaho. It's been in 
you know, um, Montana, it's been in uh, the South and Georgia, um, you know, it's just been in all small towns where I was the only black face on the plane or when I got up the plane, I was the only black person at the carousel getting my bags. And I've always been met with positive comments, a smile, a hello, uh, you know, can I help you? Are you looking for something? You know, how can I be of assistance? So I have grown to believe that my whole, um, um, view of life is that people are basically good. Uh, and so you have to couch my comments in that framework. Uh, and so I, that's why I believe reminding yourself and leveling the playing, the leveling the playing field by starting conversations out with that really helps people have an openness to listen to people who have differences of opinions is that, look, I, I, I really I like people. You know, I really want this to be a better society. So now let's start talking about what are the problems? What are, what are we concerned about with what's happening? So that's why I felt like I titled it, you know, what do you say and how do you say it? (laughs) Because people, a lot of people know what they want to say. They just don't know how to say it. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because when you look at everything that's happening right now, I don't think a lot of people are looking through the lens that most people are inherently good. And gosh, what a difference that would make if that was the case. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I also believe, and I, I, I wanted to remind myself to say this is that many black people are thought to be unidimensional by that. I mean, we're all the same one black person, whatever they say, is speaking for the entire race. And I just want to tell the viewers, this is just one viewpoint. There are many others. There are people who are much more conservative than I am. There are people that, you know, like you say, don't believe that people are good. Some people believe that everyone is actually inherently selfish and is only looking out for themselves. I just, I just don't, I don't believe that. And so, again, everybody who's listening, understand the lens, and and maybe we'll get into a little bit of why I feel that way, but um, that's where all of this is coming from. Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of that, actually. (laughs) But I just want to say, if you're coming at this with, like, I think everybody, like, is bad and everybody hates me, I or, you know, everybody hates Black people, you're going to have a difficult time with what's going on um, because you're going to be closed minded to, you know, the ideas and the controversies that we're trying to work through as a society right now. You know, one of my dear friends makes an analogy that I love and I use this often. It's, it's if we're thinking that all people of a certain race are just the same way, it, it'd be like saying all French are good cooks, which we know is not true. So why would we hold other people to high, you know, to these standards, like oh, all these people are a certain way or, you know, these people over here are a different way. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're human. Everyone's a human being. Right. And I, so, so let me, let me, this may sound like I'm going back a little or a little bit, but, what I've learned um, through some real intensive and focused um, learning over the last week is that people may be inherently good, but that doesn't mean that they don't harbor overt feelings about certain races. Uh, by being good, I mean, I don't think people inherently want to cause harm or violence to other human beings. But I think that the disconnect is that we've been brainwashed to a certain extent to cause us to still have negative thoughts about certain races. And this is what I really wanted to get into with you and our conversation. And you've, you and I have had sort of conversations about this a little bit, but what I have found is that if you take the time and go back and read and understand that this country 
is from a, from a black perspective is 400 years of oppression. And even though uh, the 13th amendment uh, outlawed slavery, uh, you know, around 1865 or so, um, there has been a backlash, I think, um, from the whole civil war experience that has put this country on a trajectory that I think exactly explains why we are where we are today. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and if we have a, a minute for me to articulate that a little bit better, I'd like to, to do that. If we I, have plenty of time. There's, <laughs> yeah, you don't have to worry about the time. You know? All right. So, so I'm asking you and your, and your listeners just, it's, it's a, it, it's, may be perceived as a conspiracy theory, but I think if you, again, I challenge you, there's a great PBS documentary on reconstruction put out by uh, Henry, Henry Louis Gates that is just outstanding. But it really talks about the fact that, you know, first of all, the Civil War clearly was a war to be able to have slaves because slave labor was the I mean, it was the rock solid um, force that allowed the South to be prosperous uh, from an economic standpoint and from a labor standpoint. So by stripping them of slaves and by making these people equals, number one, it undermined their whole economic um, development. And number two, I want people to remember that these are people today, we call these people uh, treasonous. <laughs> this is this would be like me saying I don't believe in the United States of America, and I want everybody where I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I want us to break away from the United States of America, and I want us to form a separate colony. And we are an enemy of the state. That is what tre- the definition of treason is. So, first of all, for those people who want to glorify the Civil War and all of these uh, monuments, etc., and say you know, these are glorifying characters that we want to remember for the sake of history. These are enemies of the state that were out to destroy everything we believe in. And, you know, the North prevailed, so the United States prevailed. So we have to remember that these were people who wanted to destroy the government that we so dearly enjoy. So when you talk about you know, putting up a statue to honor someone, it's, it's like literally putting up a statue of Hitler in Germany to say, well, we just want to honor the memory of Hitler because, you know, we, wanna, we don't want to forget history. I mean, it would, it would literally be that. And obviously, <laughs> the Germans have not allowed that. Uh, and I don't think we should either. But I think after looking at Um, a lot of videos and doing a lot of reading, what I find is the North really wanted to penalize the South (laughs) for trying to defect from the United States. And they wanted them to do things like they wanted uh, to give voting rights and equal status to Black people in the South, where they hadn't even done that in the North. And so I really believe that Southerners felt like they were truly being punished. As a matter of fact, for a period of time, even after we were brought together, they were not acknowledged and brought back into the union immediately. So they were tortured. And if you add that torture and that anger and that hostility with recognizing that the very people that you had enslaved now have equal status, they can vote, they can run for office, they can be judges. <laughs> I mean, it was like the biggest slap in the face of white Southerners. And I really think that, you know, the most beautiful thing about Reconstruction is it was probably for a period of time, it was an incredible, successful social experiment where literally we allow people who were enslaved to take um uh, charge of their own destiny. They were politicians. They were lawyers. They were judges. Um, they owned land in some in some cases. But all of that 
because of politics and politics between Democrats and Republicans after about 10 years was totally wiped out in order for Republicans to keep the office of the presidency. And from that point on in time, they're about, I'd say, uh, 1875, 1877 in there. And by the way, I'm not trying to uh, push myself off as, an, as a historian. I'm just learning this like everybody else. So if there are people out there who know the exact dates and facts, please understand. I'm just trying to enlighten people and, and, and learn myself. But right around 10 years of Reconstruction, everything was totally reversed. You had just the opposite. You had all these laws that came into effect. And you can look these up, Jim Crow laws that were put in effect to literally take away all those rights and subjugate those people. And white Southerners did a great job of convincing white Americans, North and South, that black people um, were heathens, they were inhuman, they were apes, they didn't know how to, 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 uh, to be uh, citizens. Um, they, uh, you see the emergence of scientific um, rule and, and, and studies being put out by you know, institutions like Harvard and Princeton and institutions in France saying that really intelligence is based on the size of the brain and that you know, based on the size of the black brain, they could never be intelligent. And so they do a great job of convincing the whole United States that this is a failed experiment and that these people should not have uh, the rights that we have. And they should, you know, we should have separate uh, education, separate housing, separate restaurants, separate transportation, everything. And if, if you start there and look at the history and, and the fact that there were laws that said if a black person couldn't prove that they had a job, you could be arrested for vagrancy and you would be put in prison and then you could be sold out to a white um, uh, businessman and if, in effect, you would become a slave again. <laughs> And the people who upheld those laws were policemen, you know? And so you start out in 1877 where the police are clearly the agents that are held accountable to hold the race down and to keep them in their place and clearly have these um, stereotypes inbred in their brain for a hundred (laughs) years. And then people today want to know, why is it that black people don't trust police? (laughs) You know, and why is it that we think black people are lazy? And why is it that we think black people aren't smart? And why is it that we resent the fact, uh, you know, the whole affirmative action debate is that that black person is there and is taking a place of another smart white person. All of that is an extension of a hundred years of convincing society that we were not smart and we were inferior. And so I challenge everybody to go back and, and read the history. You know, unfortunately the internet is maybe it's 75% correct. In some cases, maybe it's 90% correct. I mean, I trust PBS and I trust some of the scholars. And so if you look for some of the scholarly people you can literally educate yourself about all of this and read articles and read books and whatnot. And you, you can clearly understand what is happening today. Um, and it, it's, it's, and, and you can stop me anytime you want, <laughs> but I'm just going to say one other thing. It's fascinating to me. The people that now are saying, I get it. <laughs> The commissioner of the NFL, who probably is the single most, the highest employer of African-Americans, you know, (laughs) because of all the black athletes. And he says it in a live interview that I saw last night. He says, look, you know, 
I employ all these African-Americans. The NFL wouldn't be the NFL without African-Americans. And he says, I want people to know black lives matter. I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> uh, and, and let's let's come back. Let's examine that whole black lives matter phrase. But what I'm finding is that people are reading and understanding and go, I get it. <laughs> I get it why people are at the end of their leash and they're just burning things and there's violence because they are tired of begging folks to understand we are human beings. All we want is the opportunity to participate in this society. And then you've got people like myself who is part of the 1% of African-Americans who've managed to get into Ivy League schools and manage to get into med school and manage to get into difficult subspecialties like orthopedic surgery who um, are trying to appeal to folks and say, listen, we, we really are capable of being smart. You know, here's an example. (laughs) So um, it, it, you know, that's what drove me to write the article. Um, But, but you cannot, begin to have the discussions without a willingness to listen and without understanding the history that has gotten us to this point. So let me, let me pause there. Yeah. I mean, there is so much history that goes with this. I was you know, pretty floored when you go back and you start really doing some research and you had shared with me um, this one video from is uh, 13th. And I, you know, you, you watch this and you're like, goodness, you know, this has been going on um, for a very long time. So you can understand really what is happening today, why we're at the boiling point that we are. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it, as we look at the dysfunction of Congress and the Senate and the the dysfunction of the three branches of government that came out of the constitution, you begin to see the bartering and the, the manipulation of laws in order to compromise where people realized, you know, slavery probably isn't a good thing. (laughs) Um, Owning a slave probably isn't a good thing, but let's put this little clause in the 13th amendment that says, Slavery is illegal, except if you are um, a prisoner because you're a criminal. So that little loophole allowed people to say, all right, let's figure out excuses to arrest black folks for eyeball rape, for um, violating what we call the Southern graces, where if a white man started walking across the street first, and you walked across the street before him, that was a violation of the Southern grace. You could be arrested. If you looked at someone the wrong way, if you looked at a white woman the wrong way, that could be called eyeball rape. And I challenge people, just Google this stuff. I'm not making this up. Eyeball rape. (laughs) But it allowed people to put us in prison so that they could then go back and use us as slaves again. And they use these people, these chain gangs, to rebuild the South. And, and it, it just, it, it's sort of like this unresolved hatred for America for taking away the right to own a slave and really punishing us is that I think the South has never gotten over that. And these people that have Confederate flags that say, well, it's just, you know, I'm a history buff. That is BS. Those are people who have not accepted the fact that this is the United States of America and they still believe in the Confederacy where we had the right to own slaves. Those are people who are still pissed that I have to sit at a store or or at a restaurant and I have to be there and they have to allow other black people. I can't go somewhere where black people aren't allowed. I mean, that is embodied in this whole infatuation with the Confederacy. And again, you, 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 you don't understand that and you get, you buy into this whole, um, you know, myth 
mythology <laughs> of the Confederate flag and the statues if you don't know that it came out of this hatred. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but the Confederate statues were put up long after the Civil War. They were put up during a Jim Crow time where white people wanted to remind black folks that white supremacy is still the rule of the day. And we, 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 we say that, but then we flip over and you see the acknowledgement of one branch of the armed services came out and said they're going to try and take all the Confederate propaganda and get it out of their, uh, out of their system because they've acknowledged the perpetuation of these treasonous, these traitors. And the United States Army says, no, we're not going to even consider that. <laughs> Mm-mm-mm. So you imagine, I'm a black man. I am a, a former, I, I have an honorable discharge from the United States Army. And imagine I'm doing my training at Fort Benning, who's named after a Confederate general, who, by the way, is was an incompetent. <laughs> he wasn't even a Confederate general that we want to remember. The guy was incompetent. They say he was responsible for many of the losses of the South that led to the North winning the Civil War. But it was a way for the army to get um, forts and to get installations in the South. It was, it was an appeasement. Okay, if you want to set up a military institution, institution you need to call it uh, a Confederate general and we'll let you do it. And they said, okay, I, I, I don't care. <laughs> you know, what's in a name? Well, yeah, now we know what's in a name. So again... Read the history. Understand why we've had almost 10 days, <laughs> 10 days, you know, of protests that seem to just keep gaining more and more momentum. Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting. You know, um, I grew up in California, have lived in Colorado, and recently moved to North Carolina. And during the two years I've been here, I've been called a Yankee by a hairdresser. <laughs> and one of the parks that I love to go walking by, you know, if you go on one, if you go keep going, I think it's like north of the park, there is a property that has a huge Confederate flag there. So these things are completely foreign to me. And to show up in a place where I find these, you know, this kind of mannerism really distasteful and yeah, and it's bigotry in, in many ways. It's it just is really interesting how you know some of the southern feelings are still so raw, you know. And at some point, we need to reflect on why people are treating people a certain way or presenting themselves a certain way, and, and maybe asking these different questions like, "What can I do to build a better country? How can I change my perspective?" You know, and maybe what I've been taught to believe all this time is not true. You know, I again, I, I think it's a combination of the fact that the South never got over losing the war and the fact that the North wanted to punish them for wanting to succeed and the fact that the genius of the white supremacists of the day who said, look, if we can get all white people to understand why we enslave these people because they are not smart and they can't uh, function in society. And oh, by the way, they will rape and pillage our women. And they literally were afraid that they will take over and we'll all be mulattoes and the white race will become extinct. It was really a white nationalist fear and it's been propagated so effectively (laughs) that we still have vestiges of it today. And now, you know, I, I think it's a beautiful thing of all, you know, I hate to use this word, awakening because people have sort of made ridicule of it about being woke, but it really is. There are a lot of people 
as a result of what has happened are are seeing they're saying wait a minute this is tied to the whole notion that this race is inferior and that they are inherently more violent and they're bigger and we it takes 10 of us to get them down and you know black women are strong and that's why we belly flop them on the ground with these big policemen because we know they're so strong they've survived through all of this torture we've given them so this is the force we have to use to handle these people and when you think about it 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 makes all the sense in the world and the only way we are going to get beyond this is to begin to recognize that black people bleed like everybody else that you know princeton's uh number one student this year was an african american male for the first time in the history of the school um that you know we are smart <laughs> that there are lots of inventions and things that this country was built on the back of our labor and a lot of our inventions if you think about um charles drew who invented you know the way to store blood plasma which changed the course of world war 2 i mean so there there there's so much evidence that we are just like everybody else <laughs> but we're not treated like everybody else and that gets us to the very simple notion that black lives matter and i saw something on tv today when someone says black lives matter and someone says well all lives matter it's like saying well my mother died and someone saying well everybody dies <laughs> you know the point is black lives matter is not intended to be exclusive it's intended to identify this is the only group that doesn't appear to matter <laughs> and again people like rudy giuliani who i think was the one who coined the blue lives matter they people get so defensive when they hear anything black that their immediate defensive reaction is well wait a minute blue lives matter too and uh, of course we know that that's the obvious we don't need to state the obvious we need to state what isn't obvious that apparently the only people in our society who don't matter are the race of people who were enslaved in this country and treated a certain way because they were thought to be inferior and that is uniquely african american <laughs> now there are other people who spill over <laughs> into that cuz it it now it becomes you know really it's not black people it's person of color and Marianne is person of color because I can't look at you and tell whether you're African American or not. All I can do is say, well, if black people are inferior, all people of color must be inferior too because you look like them, <laughs> right? And so it it just it again it explains why you know people who come from India have the same problem. It explains why you know people who come from other parts of Africa have the same problem because of the unique experience that African Americans had and it translated over. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for taking the time to explain Black Lives Matter to us. I think it's important that everyone has an understanding of what that really means, and a lot of times people just don't even know where to go to ask these questions. So on that note, we are going to pause here to take a quick break. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne with special guest Dr. Herman Williams. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. 
teaching beyond conventional wisdom. Her work is described as life-changing. Visit judygoodman.com. That's judygoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest Dr. Herman Williams. Dr. Williams, before Left for Break, we were talking about Black Lives Matter. I think it's so important people understand what that's all about. And I really appreciate you taking the time to really dive into that. I, I just want to clear up that whole Black Lives Matter. I, people just, that's why when the commissioner used it, it is so hard for that to come out of white people's mouths because they think what it is is a proclamation of a special designation. It's a special attention. It's an affirmative action. (laughs) It's not. It's to state the only people who are not afforded the rights. And I I tell people, stop being defensive about it. You know? So... Um, I, again, thank you for letting me articulate some, some, some of this stuff. And I, I hope people are going, oh, wow, I get it. I see, you know, and I, I, it'd be nice if we had some dialogue uh, with other folks who maybe have opposing or different views. But I think it's just so it comes back to that whole notion of how you feel about the black race in general and them as part of this society. And that dictates how you feel about what's happening. Yeah, I I think a lot of people are going through a deep education right now in how African-Americans feel. Because, I mean, most people go throughout their day and don't consider these kind of things. They may say, oh, you know, I'm just driving around. No problem when the police pull me over, you know, whatever. But it could be a very different experience for other people. Yeah. And, and I, and I have to say, I, you know, I, I had another, um, I've, I've had, I, I want to tell people, I've just had so many positive experiences. I had a guy who called me who I went to college with and, uh, he read my book, uh, and he contacted another guy who had my number and he called me and we get on the phone and we're talking and he goes, Herman, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't even remember if you and I were friends. But what I do remember is that I have a positive feeling about you. I don't know why. And, and I said to him, you know, I said, Kevin, you know, it's funny because I, I feel that way about you. I, when I, I, I don't know whether we were friends or not. But because he said, I feel guilty. About, I said, look, <laughs> don't feel guilty unless you are involved in some overt effort to subjugate someone else or to do harm to someone, you can't feel guilty about your birthright. I mean, it it is what it is, right? And I said, don't feel guilty. Uh, And I said, even though, because he says, I I felt none of the stuff you felt in college. And I said, you must have done something compassionate because of all the experiences, I had so many negative experiences in college. When I think of you, I get this sort of warm feeling. And so I said, really, you know, don't feel guilty. 
So I say to people, don't, don't approach us like, oh my God, I, I, you know, I had another friend of mine call me and she said, I feel so guilty. And I always felt guilty growing up because I grew up in Beverly Hills and we were privileged. And when I said, don't feel guilty, just do something about it now. Just treat someone, start with treating someone with kindness and treating someone fairly and start with listening and figuring out how in the world can I do something about what's going on? Start a conversation in the workplace. And if nothing else comes out of this, somebody may have a different feeling, you know, who's empowered to hire an African-American person and say, you know what? I never thought about it, but I'm going to just think a little bit more about that applicant in a different way than I've ever thought, you know, and I'm going to look and see, well, gosh, you know, um, um, this person has a different background, but maybe there's some other things that they can bring to the workplace that makes them valuable in a different sense than how we've been measuring who should be, you know, employed. So, um, don't feel guilty. Just do something positive, you know? <laughs> I, I think a lot of people, and, and I'm so glad we're having this discussion because they're just not sure what to do, what to say, just like your article, um, you know, points to. And I, you touched on something that I'd like to kind of unpack here a little bit. You talked about having some really difficult experiences. Have you personally experienced racism? Oh, yes, of course. Absolutely. Um. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So um, I was part of the busing experience in Los Angeles, California. Um, even though I grew up in a middle-class family, which I would define by two parents who were employed, educated, and both had master's degrees. Um, you know, we, were, we still were in neighborhoods where the schools were not that great. And so I was, you know, a, a, a small group of us were bused into white areas. Uh, and I was bused to um, Emerson Junior High School and to Beverly Hills High School, uh, one in West Los Angeles and one in Beverly Hills. And frequently um, during the 60s and 70s, we would have policemen as we were walking from school to the bus stop in the shortest route, <laughs> we would have policemen drive up and say, where are you guys going? What are you doing? So I experienced uh, racism in that regard. Um, I think the, the most, uh, so um, actually, wow, now that you, you're bringing up memories, I experienced um, one violent act where um, a white friend and I, who lived in West Los Angeles, um, were playing cops and robbers. Um, and we had, um, we had these, uh, fake, um, guns that you, at the time, you know, they had these guns where you shoot them and it it would hit a little sticker and it would pop. They're called cap guns or whatever. Um, and so we were, we were playing cops and robbers in the neighborhood. And what had happened is, this guy saw us playing and he took my friend um, in his house and sat him down. And I guess he had some words for him. And then I couldn't find my friend and I was looking for him and I happened to look up and someone across the street pointed to this um, building. He said, your friend's over there. So I walked in, and as I walked in, this man came out, took me, um, proceeded to throw me through a glass window. Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it didn't really beat me up, but I, I guess maybe because when he threw me through the window, I was, you know, I was out. Uh, you know, police came, everything. Um, we sued the guy, um, and he basically got off because – the judge said we were on his property and he could have done anything to us and it would have been legal. So, Mm -hmm. um, of course he didn't harm my white friend, but he, you know, and, and, you know, we were kids, we were like, gosh, I was in junior high school. So, 
you know, 13, 12. Um, he didn't harm him, but he, you know, threw me yeah, through. Your child. Right. Right. So I've, I've experienced things like that. I've experienced racial profiling, but I think the worst, the absolute worst act of racism that I've experienced is my high school counselor. Uh, when I told him that I, I, what, what had happened is I went to city schools all my life, but I was fortunate enough that um, I went to Phillips Academy uh, Andover, which is a private school in Boston. And I just had such a great experience that I said, you know what? I want to go back to college in Massachusetts. And I want to go to an Ivy league school. And the worst, most atrocious act of racism was my counselor told me there's no way you'll ever get into an Ivy league school. So there's no need to even apply. Don't even do it. Oh my gosh. You know, I had a 3.6 GPA in high school. I was, I, I had, uh, I was the outstanding musician of the year at graduation. I was an athlete. Um, you know, I think I participated in the, the governance there. I was an outspoken kid. I, I, um, and so there was no reason why he had the feelings that he had. And thank God my parents told me you can do anything you want to do. And so I applied to Amherst college, which at the time was the number one school and may still be the number one or number two by USA um, uh, world news today. Um, But I got in to Amherst College and the, 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 the worst act is for someone to stifle someone's belief that they can do something that is, you know, something you can dream of and set dreams that seem impossible. I had my other counselor in college what do you want to do, Herman? Now I'm at the number one college in America. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I tell the guy, I want to be a doctor. He says, you'll never be a doctor. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? You will never be a doctor. Don't even, you just don't oh even gosh. do it. If I had listened to him, <laughs> I don't know what I would have been, but I said, I, <laughs> I said, you know, how can you tell someone that that is the worst act of racism is to project onto someone your limited view of what you think they could be or do and impact their lives because they're looking at you as a knowledgeable individual. You're my counselor. If you don't think I can be a doctor for crying out loud, who does? There's no way I'm going to be a doctor. My counselor just told me I'd never, I'll never do it. So, you know, I think even though I haven't experienced a lot of violence, I have experienced violence. I have experienced racial profiling. Um, and I have experienced, um, you know, stigma and, um, racism by people trying to deter me from being the best I can be for this society. And I think that is just a huge crime. Now, I have also (laughs) experienced the most miraculous things in life from white males, including uh, one man, uh, Bill Mixon, who saved my life and performed CPR on me. And I, I, uh, so again, in in the article that I wrote, I talked about thanking Bill for the gift of believing that there is hope (laughs) because in order for things to change, you have to believe and you have to have hope. And the fact that he told me, Herman, when I saved your life, I didn't think this is a black man. Do I want to give him CPR? (laughs) I said, this is a human being who just went down and in a millisecond, he did something. And so I want to tell listeners, you know, this is not, this is a positive story, (laughs) you know, but we've got to 
feel the pain of what the other 85% or so of, of African Americans who haven't had the experience that I've had. You know, people say, well, things have changed. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, things have changed. We've had a black president, <laughs> but we've also had the worst president after that black president. Um, and I say that just if we just look at it from a pure leadership, let's let's put on our MBA hats <laughs> and let's look through time you know, good to great. Let's look at all the great leaders we love in this country, you know, Kennedy, you know, you name them. And and tell me how many of those leadership skills does our current president have? Zero, you know? And so, yeah, things are better than they were 50 years ago, but comparatively speaking, there are new racist things and institutional racism that have been put in place to replace the overt uh, racism that existed, you know, 50 years ago. Well, it's easy to see why, you know, Al Sharpton said at George Floyd's memorial, get, get your knee off our neck. Yeah. You know, and it's just, it is you, because there is a systemic, racism that I think is being addressed right now, we're at this boiling point. Where do you think we go from here? Because while there's lots of protests that are happening, a lot of activity that's happening, it sometimes it feels also like, okay, so how do we move from where we're at to where we can really, you know, not just start the dialogue, but start enforcing some change? Right. Great question. First of all, I would say there's already been change. And we already, I would say, we, I don't believe you can ever go back, okay? Yeah. So we've, we've forever been changed. Uh, and I heard this one black conservative uh, woman say she resented the fact that we were making a hero out of George Floyd. You know, George Floyd... Um, is really not a hero. George Floyd is a victim that had to happen in order for the world <laughs> to take a step forward, right? Mm -hmm. And I say the world because you see people protesting for the United States in other countries because they get it. So already there's been change because there's been a level of awareness that didn't exist prior to George, George Floyd's death. And there are many other people that came before George Floyd that basically, exactly. I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm, I'm not really putting this correctly, but it seems like this has come to a tipping point where George Floyd was really the catalyst to move us in the direction we're going. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the whole social dynamics around it, because arguably the Arbery case is more overt. <laughs> you know, the Arbery case is literally where three vigilantes, at least two, there's now there may be a third one, two vigilantes decided to go out, whether, you know, they, let's say they were making a citizen's arrest or not, but usually when you call someone the N-word after you shoot them and kill them, you aren't like doing it in the name of justice. You're doing it in the name of hatred and you're doing it in the name of being brainwashed by the 400 years that preceded you. Um, arguably, that was more overt than... George Floyd, because some people are still saying he did some criminal act, and I, I, I'm yet, I yet to know what that is. That doesn't make his death any fair. But I think the fact that we watched that man die on national TV, somehow, it was, it was just enough is enough. And so, so first of all, I don't think I think there's been so much awareness raised 
and so many non-African American people who their consciousness has been raised as we can see that already things have changed. I think the next step obviously is to have the trial and to have some justice because people both white and black have to believe that our justice system works, <laughs> right? Even though we know that it's disproportionately against people of color. Why? Because of a history. Not because people go to law school and they go, I hate black people and I'm going to treat them differently. It's because historically the system that we've inherited grew out of a system where black people were incarcerated to try and re-enslave them so that we can keep our fingers on them. So we have to get justice and then we have to figure out, okay, how can we begin to try and identify these institutional racist mechanisms and see how we can modify those so that we can make, make things fair. Yeah. Uh, And, 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 you know, I, I think, I think the violence has got to stop, but, you know, we're at war. (laughs) This is a war against racism and there's collateral damage. And George Floyd is collateral damage. The elderly man that was knocked and cracked his head is collateral damage. There are three police officers who are killed. All of these people are part of this whole process that we have to go through until we reach some equilibrium and understand that violence is not the way. And once all that stops, then we can have, you know, some productive conversations, but you know, the, let me just make a a couple of other points. The sad part is two of those police officers, I think one of them was his second day. One of them was his fourth day on the force. That guy is going to go to jail because he probably was afraid to speak up. And I think one of them did. And the police officer said, no. (laughs) And a friend of mine who's in the army, he said, this is a chain of command. You don't tell your sergeant, sergeant, could you get your knee off the guy's neck? He can't breathe. I mean, if you you make a, with with due respect, um, sir, would you mind if we turned him over on his back? No. Yes, sir. So, so they're, those guys are casualties of this thing also. Um, it's, you know, it almost seems like there needs to be a whole reconstruction of just not the judicial system, but also how policing is done. And if it is the hierarchy that you're talking about, which I've heard it is, then we need to look at that too and change that as well. We do. And, you know, again, I think we have to start with understanding and compassion. And again, I, how hard is it with all the negativism uh, put around um, Kaepernick taking a knee and all the association with defaming the country and the flag and all this stuff? How hard is it for a policeman to get down on a knee That's what I see is that compassion, that policeman saying, look, I don't get this. (laughs) I may not even believe in this, but this is my gesture of coming halfway across the aisle to say, I'm going to try and be better. That's the kind of things that are going to get us beyond this. You know, not 57 people resigning right? But 57 people, officers taking a knee with demonstrators, the police chief taking off his hat and apologizing to George Floyd's brother for what happened. I mean, that those are the things that are going to get us to a point where we can make real change. And then we've got, like you said, we've got to change the institutions We have to examine the things that are put in place to disproportionately impact people of color. 
And, you know, I'd even take it a step further. I know when we have police officers that are on the streets for years and years and years, I mean, they're at a disproportionate high rate for suicide and PTSD because of secondary PTSD. We need to look at the mental health of our police officers and not make it like this shameful thing. In some departments, if they go to seek help for PTSD or because they've seen a tragedy, they could get fired. Yeah. And so we've got that all wrong. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think um, um, we have to, we need the police. <laughs> we need to trust them. Um, you know, one of the, I, I like to do random acts of ki- kindness. One of the things I do whenever I see policemen eating in a restaurant or getting a cup of coffee or donuts or something, I always buy their meals. I, I say, and, and, and they are so appreciative. Um, and I do that because I want them to see that we do care about them. We do appreciate them. And I hope that if they encounter another black person, they can rem- they remember, you remember that black guy that bought us that our dinner that day, you know, you know, I mean, I, I just think that it has a ripple effect. And so I don't want to leave um, the policemen out. We're, we're all victims of our past. Black people are racist against black people because of our brainwashing. So we're, no one is innocent here, but inaction is just as guilty. You know, if you're enjoying the benefits and you're not doing anything, it's like saying, I think it's okay. So, you know, I think what I say to people, examine what control you have. If you are an executive, if you're a leader, if you're over a group of people, try and use that leadership and your influence to make a difference. Um, Tell people you care about them. Um, Try and be compassionate. I think that's, that's another way out of this is just compassion for human existence, compassion. Um, if you, if you feel like you need to protest, do that. You know, I can't protest because I'm at risk for COVID. I'm just, you know, part of the population that is significantly at risk. Uh, and so otherwise I'd probably be out there protesting. So if you can protest, do that. If you can make a difference, do that. If you can hire another person of color because not because of a handout, but because they're qualified, but you think, you know, actually this candidate is a little bit above the pack because they bring some diversity to the workplace. And we're not thinking about an idea only through one lens. Everybody knows that. Everybody who's gone to business school, runs a business knows the more ideas and the more diverse the ideas, the better the outcome. Without a doubt, yeah. So every you just figure out what can I do in my little space, and if it's nothing else but smile, then do that. So I mean, I've heard I you know I see a lot of things online, and there's so much out there, and a lot of times you have to fish through it to see like not just perspectives, but what is actually true. And some things I've seen, you know, is a call almost to say that asking for peace during this time is arrogant. I mean, what are your thoughts around that? You know, I, I, again, I think, look, it change is brought about by everything. (laughs) Any major change, you know, you pick it is probably started with, a protest and sometimes with violence and death and, you know, so there are some people who have a calling to do certain things and others have a calling to to take it another way. I believe in the peaceful approach. I believe in love. I believe in compassion. And that's my tool. Other people will say, you know, screw compassion. I've done that enough. It hasn't worked. So I believe, you know, in going out and burning some, crap down. I mean, I don't agree with that, but, you know, clearly compassion is not enough. (laughs) Uh, And so, um, you know, unfortunately, change is brought about by a series of events and 
hopefully that violence, um, you know, is minimized and hopefully it, it's eliminated. But I'm not sure that, that that's the case because, you know, now we have, so it, it really puts into perspective, the whole white supremacist movement, it, 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 it's clear as day. It, it, it's not that it just popped up. <laughs> it never went away. <laughs> It, it is rooted back in, you know, when slavery was legal. And those people believe, just like I believe in compassion and love, those people believe that they are, they were born to rule the earth. And, you know, and they haven't made their mark yet. Okay, so understand there's going to be counter violence. Uh, so we're not done yet. And we have a person who is quick to make Antifa um, a hate group, yet right under his nose, a group that believes in violence and commits violence in the, in the name of white supremacy, he won't name them a hate group. That is, the, that is the fuel for the violence that you're seeing now. That's the fuel for the fire. You know? So where do you think we can go from here? Because I know a lot of leaders and people are coming together. I mean, what changes would you like to see made? You know, I say to people, you know, (laughs) um, put my comments into context. I'm I'm an African-American man who has benefited from the American dream and has had his life saved by a white man. So uh, I am an eternal optimist. So I believe in positive change. I believe let's start by changing some of the institutional barriers to allowing uh, people of color to have access to this society to make it a better society. And that's education, that's, you know, that's health care, you know, which should be a right. That's, you know, some, so let's just start with the basic stuff. Um, that's food, that's dealing with poverty. And I think some of this other stuff, crime, um, will, could be addressed by easing the living conditions of people. Uh, you've got to deal with the police. You've got to educate the police and you have to, make them aware of the history because they don't even know why they feel the way they feel, you know? And so I think you've, so you've, you've got to deal with the police because the police are the ones that are given the single job of enforcing the societal rules. And so, uh, you know, aside from dealing with the basics, education, uh, healthcare, living conditions, you've got to deal with the people who are charged with keeping folks down (laughs) and educate them and change that. And I, I, you know, that's, I think that would be a good start, (laughs) Um, but everybody can act at their own level. So don't just do that. Do whatever you can. In the meantime, have conversations, tell people you care about them, you know, I I think that is a good way to move the needle forward. I mean, I'm all for peaceful protesting. You know, I I follow more of a Buddhist kind of path. Mm -hmm. And even Gandhi said, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. And, you know, Mm -hmm. so I I, I see all, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look at the bigger picture and seeing all sides of how people are feeling. I'm so glad that we're able to have this discussion because it I've learned a lot. I continue to learn a lot. And I think our listeners are as well. So, you know, thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. And, you know, the education can only come about by using media to reach the masses. And so, you know, what you're doing by giving me a voice is just amplifying the message of peace and love and and awareness. And so I thank you for that because you could be using this tool for, you know, educating people about, you know, nutrition and, (laughs) you know, other things that have nothing to do with what's going on. And so I commend you for stepping up to the plate 
and using your vehicle to try and make a difference. So thank you, uh, Marianne. Well, thank you, Dr. Williams. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to have this candid discussion. I think a lot of people are really craving for this type of dialogue, and I'm so grateful that we were able to spend this time with you. If you'd like to connect with Dr. Williams, you can at his website, clearlivingthelife.com for more information. Make sure to connect with him on LinkedIn and, of course, read his article, What Do I Say? How Do I Say It? and join in on the conversation. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.